So let's start. Uh, we are almost done with the with our discussion related to basics of uh, semiconductors, and today we'll wind up the discussion with uh, uh, you know a look at uh, how uh, some of the important parameters uh, that we have talked about how they are measured, uh, and we we'll look at a few key experiments which allow us to measure these uh, values here. One of the uh, very famous uh, experiment uh, uh, method is what is uh, named as Hall effect. And uh, the way this particular method works is uh, if you see here, you have a sample, let's say a silicon sample. And what you do in this particular silicon sample is you pass current through the silicon sample here. So the current is flowing from one end and exiting at the other end. So that's what is happening to the current. Current is flowing in X direction. So if you have a semiconductor which has holes in it, it's a p-type, then the holes, as you know, would be drifting in the direction of the current here. So that would be the direction of the uh, drift velocity of holes here. On the other hand, if it has electrons, the electrons would be drifting opposite to the direction of the uh, current here, right, because they carry negative charge. Here. So, so we have a piece of semiconductor. We have applied uh, a voltage which causes a current to flow, uh, which is in the x direction. And in the z direction here, we have applied a magnetic field, H. Okay, so that's the direction of the magnetic field. And then all of you know that when you have a magnetic field acting upon a charge, you get a force. And the force that you get here, let's look at, uh, for example, the electron here, the electron. Then the force that acts is, you know, QVB, Q times minus Q electron carries a charge minus Q. It's moving in this direction here, minus Vx because for x is in this direction here. So minus Vx times Bz, this is the net force which will act on the electron here. Minus minus signs cancel, and what we get here is a force which acts, uh, V into B will give us the force acts in this particular direction here, the negative y direction here. That's the force acting upon the electron here. The same argument uh, shows us that force acting upon a hole will be, hole carries a positive charge, Vx is positive here, Bz here, so the force acting upon the hole also is in the same direction. So what this does is then, this force that you see here due to magnetic field, it tries to push the electron towards this side and tries to push the hole towards this particular side here. Now this process then, which would, as you can imagine now, it would lead to piling up of holes on this particular side here. So let's imagine for a moment that we have a p-type semiconductor and electrons are less in number. So what would happen is that the holes would start piling up on this side. As they pile up on this particular side here, what you can imagine is an electric field sets up. You have a positive charge on one side, and then it has to be compensated by negative charges somewhere else, right? So an electric field sets up. And so what you find is there would be an electric field in y direction. And eventually, as you would expect in steady state, the force due to the electric field in y direction would cancel the force that you have due to this Lorentz force here uh, because of the magnetic field here. So they would balance each other out. And at that particular point, what we have is then this force, Lorentz force here, Q, which is over here, drift velocity Vx. So we write drift velocity as current divided by Q into P. We are talking about a P-type semiconductor. So QP, you know that QP uh, will give us uh, QP times the velocity gives us the current density. So that's where this term is there. And Bz, of course, is the magnetic field. This force is balanced by a force which sets up because of accumulation of charges here and here, which results in an electric field EY. So that's equal to Q times EY, right? So that's steady state. The two forces balance each other. And therefore, what we find is, even though we applied a voltage uh, in this direction here to cause a current in X, when we apply a magnetic field, a new electric field sets up. And as a result, a new voltage will set up in the Y direction here. Because of the electric field, EY, there will also be a voltage in the Y direction here. And I can measure that particular voltage. And that voltage I will call as a Hall voltage, named after this person who first performed this particular experiment. Uh, so we can measure this voltage here that you see here between V2 and V1. Okay. In this case, what would be the direction of the voltage? So note that what would be the direction of EY? Let's focus on the holes. The Lorentz force is forcing the holes to this direction here. Uh, electric field will force the holes in the opposite direction, which means what? This side would be, this side would be positive. This side would be negative here. 
So I can go ahead and measure this particular voltage here. And if I measure this voltage here, note that I know the uh, dimensions of my uh, device. So I know the Y value of the electric field. And, and I know, of course, the current density. I know the current flowing and I know the area of cross section. So I know the current density and magnetic field is also something that I've applied. So I know its value here. So therefore, this ratio that you see here, EY, J, BZ, this ratio is called the Hall coefficient of that particular material, RH. And RH, as you can see here, is equal to 1 over Q into P here. So what is it that I can experimentally measure? I can measure the Hall voltage here. I know the current and I know the magnetic field and therefore I know RH. I can experimentally measure RH. And what does RH give me then? If it's a P-type semiconductor, gives me P, the number of free holes in my semiconductor here. So it's a direct measurement of how many holes are there. Okay, and P is what I can measure. Not only that, as you can see here now, as you can imagine that this is for a P-type semiconductor and the Hall voltage is what? Positive here and negative here. If it were an N-type semiconductor, the electrons are still not deflected in this direction, but what would be the direction of uh, voltage? Negative here and positive here, right? So the Hall voltage reverses in sign. If I have a P-type semiconductor, I get a Hall voltage with positive here and negative here. If I get an N-type semiconductor, I get a negative here and a positive here. Okay, and, and therefore it's very easy to now with the Hall voltage tell is it N-type, is it P-type? Okay, and 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 RH if you calculate here RH will come out to be minus because of the change in the direction of voltage minus one over Q times N. Okay. Minus one over Q. So what is happening with the Hall effect then is that I can measure my electron density if it is N type or a hole density if it is P type. And obviously I can distinguish whether my sample is an N type sample or a P type sample. Okay. And now this is for measurement of NNP. You can also see that if I reverse this, if I know NNP, then suppose I know NNP and I know the current. What can it give me? Suppose I take my sample, right? I take my sample, I, I, I pass a known amount of current, and I know what is NNP. It's a, it's a characterized sample. I know what is NNP, and I measure the Hall voltage. What does it give me? It gives me the magnetic field. So it's a sensor here. It's a magnetic sensor. It's, it's widely used for measuring magnetic field. So it's like an N-type semiconductor. You put it in a magnetic field. What happens? You will develop a Hall voltage here. Just measure the Hall voltage and use this relationship here. Uh, use this relationship here. So you measure Hall voltage, which means you measure EY and you know J you, uh, and, and, and you know RH also because it's a, a known sample and therefore you get BZ. So very simple way of measuring the magnetic field. So if you, uh, if you know the magnetic field, then you can use it for characterizing your sample. You can determine NNP. On the other hand, if you know NNP, you can use it as a sensor as well. Okay, so it's a very popular uh, sensor uh, where a semiconductor is used for detecting and and measuring the magnitude of the uh, magnetic field. So we know now that given a sample, we can measure what the electron density is and what the hole density is. Okay, now you can imagine how do I measure using the Hall coefficient? Hall coefficient is what I experimentally measure. Now suppose I can measure conductivity of a sample, sigma. Sigma, we've already seen conductivity of a sample very early on. If it's an n-type sample, it's Q mobility times n. Uh, we'll see in a minute how, how we can measure conductivity. So if I measure conductivity, and then you can see here, I can multiply Rh in conductivity, and I get mu. So therefore, I have mobility. Right? So I've already measured Hall coefficient. And if I can make, if I can measure conductivity, uh, then I just multiply them together and then I have mobility. So I have two important parameters already. I have free carrier density and I have mobility. Both of them I have through these two measurements here. So how do I measure conductivity? Well, you may imagine that conductivity, if I have a piece of sample, I can put two probes. I can put two probes, pass a current and measure the voltage, right? Not as simple as that. I can't just take a you know piece of sample, put two probes on it, and just measure the resistance between them. Why? Because at the point here that you note here, the current uh, there is a resistance of the probe itself. The, there's a metal and there's a semiconductor, right? So that contact itself has a 
resistance of it. Not only that, you can imagine that the current flow around the probe is a little bit complicated. You know, it spreads out from the probe here. Then as it leaves here, then you will get a well-defined current flow maybe here. Then as it enters here, you will find again current flows are different. The current flow lines are different, which means that the resistance here is different, the resistance here is different, and the resistance in the middle is something else. And if you simply measure one particular resistance, you don't know what that, you remember what you want to do? Uh, so you, you're getting something like this here. There's a contact resistance here, then there's a resistance re in, a region in the neighborhood of the contact here, which is here, and again a contact resistance here, and then the resistance in the neighborhood of this one here, plus a, a resistance in the middle here, somewhere here. So you get, and these resistances are all different. Now what your goal is, what you want is maybe the resistance in the middle here, right here, and, and use it to, uh, you know, if you know the length and the area and all that, you use it to determine the resistivity. But then direct computation of resistivity from resistance is becoming complicated because of these contact resistances and, 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 and these, uh, uh, you know, uh, different kind of a current flow here and here as compared to in the middle here. So, it's, so evaluating resistivity then is becoming a little bit of a problem, okay, because of the contact effects and all that that I mentioned here. So what people do is, instead of using two probes, there's a very popular method which is called the four probe technique. So what they do is, look at that, they place four probes here. Through the outermost two probes here, they force a current. So the current starts from here and flows here and then goes and comes out from the out, these two. The inner two probes, which is somewhere in the middle here, they use it for measuring only the voltage. So it's only, so no current flows through this part here. So now what you see here is, I have a current, I can, you know, very simple circuit diagram. I have a current which goes in here and goes here and comes out here. But then my probes are measuring only here, somewhere in the middle away from this contact here, away from this contact here. So what you're able to do is, you measure voltage here, the current is the same that flows here, V by I gives you this resistor here. And then you use this particular resistor to measure, to estimate your resistivity. So it becomes much more accurate. You know, the contact effects and all that don't bother you. You're measuring in a region which is away from this contact region here and this contact region here. Of course, there is a correction factor you have to take into account how the current is flowing between these and these here. Uh, uh, so, uh, and using some correction factors, then you can estimate uh, what is the resistivity. Okay, so a four, four probe technique is the uh, one of the most popular techniques uh, for measuring the uh, resistivity of a piece of uh, of a piece of silicon or uh, other semiconductor here. Okay, and you can see why this four probe is making the measurement more accurate. You force current through the outer probes, and you measure the voltage in between the two here, and that allows you to. <laughs> to remove the effects of the contact resistance here, contact resistance here, okay, and and uh, the other nonlinear effects here. You know, people frequently make a sample like this. If you have a semiconductor, what they do is they make a sample of of a geometry like this here, okay. So what they do is, you know, this sample uh, would allow you to uh, measure both the Hall voltage as well as carry out four probe measurements here. So what you do is between one and two. What you do is you apply a voltage and you force a current between one and two, right? You, so your current flows here. And then if you're doing Hall measurement, then what you do is between three and four, you measure the Hall voltage. Remember the Hall voltage is measured perpendicular to the direction of current flow. So between three or four or between five and six, you can measure the Hall voltage and use it for your uh, carrier density calculation. Four probe is you pass a current here and current here, and if you probe, you measure the voltage between three and five, that will give you the, you, you can use it for resistivity calculation. Okay, so from a same sample, you do a, a, a hall measurement, you measure between three and four, get the carrier density, you measure the voltage between three and five, and then you get the resistivity of this part, part of the sample. Okay. All right, so this is an example of uh, very early on, uh, uh, a very old paper which is talking about uh, the electrical conductivity and Hall effect. So you can see what they're plotting is uh, 1 over T, 1 over temperature. So they measure it as a function of temperature. This is the their Hall effect data here, experimental measurements. So they're plotting log of R, the Hall coefficient here. And so you can see here the Hall coefficient RH starts from here. This is higher temperature. Then as you go here, it goes like this. 
Does it make sense? All coefficient going up like this here. Why is it constant? All coefficient is what? Note here, 1 over Qn. N is constant. Does it make sense? N is constant. If I have room temperature or, or uh, higher temperatures, all donors are ionized, and therefore uh, my N is a constant. Then as I keep on reducing temperature, so if I go in this direction, I'm reducing temperature, what happens? My donors now are no longer all ionized, and N starts dropping. N starts dropping, and therefore the Hall coefficient, you can see here, starts increasing. Okay, so this behavior that you see here is all because of donor freeze out. So you see that here. On the other hand, look at the conductivity. Conductivity shows uh, this kind of a behavior here. So conductivity, of course, is a product of both mobility. Mobility varies with uh, temperature, and N is also varying with temperature here. And therefore, as I said, I know N through this particular part here. All this will give me N. And then sigma is simply a product here, so I get mobility also. So from here, I'll get mobility as a function of temperature also. So I'll, I'll, I'll get that too. And uh, note that we had said, we had discussed earlier while discussing doping, that if I look at my electron density at lower temperature, the electron density is falling exponentially. Electron density falls exponentially. And this is the relationship that we can theoretically derive. N0 is exponent minus EC minus ED by 2KT here. Now, N0 is nothing but Hall coefficient here. So what, me, what it means is that this part of the curve that you see here, Hall coefficient, you can see here is a log. So this is an exponential characteristic here. So from this part of the characteristics, I can, I, can, I can use this relationship to explain this part of the characteristics. And therefore, I can get EC minus ED. So I can find out where my donor level is. At, uh, uh, from the conduction band, where the donor level is, I can measure that as well. So note, uh, through some uh, fairly simple measurements, you're finding out what the electron density is, what the mobility is as a function of temperature, and you can also find out where the donors are with respect to the conduction band. And if I do the same thing with Wellis band, I'll find out where the acceptors are. All right, so we have obtained three things, electron density, mobility, and as well as the positions of the donor or the acceptor ions through these measurements. This, this is another very simple experiment that one can do, which is called a hot probe experiment, where uh, uh, you, you have a piece of sample and you have one probe which is heated. Okay, It could be a soldering iron, which is hot, and so you place it here, it's hot here. The other one is a normal probe, which is cold, and you measure the voltage in between them. And if you measure the voltage in between, so what happens is if they are of the same temperature, you don't see anything. Uh, no voltage, obviously, but if you make one of them hot and the other one cold, a voltage develops, and you can measure the voltage here. And as we will see, uh, you know, soon if it's a p-type semiconductor, you get one polarity of the voltage. If it's an n-type semiconductor, you get another polarity. And so, very easy by using two probes, one hot and one cold, you can tell well, is it p-type or is it n-type? Okay. Why is this happening? Well, there is it's, it's sort of complicated. There are a lot of effects which are occurring, but one of the uh, uh, effects is, if you note, if I'm considering a p-type. P-type, we have said, p0 is nv exponent minus ef minus ev by kt. And I can take this expression and write where is ef compared to wellness band using this expression. here. Okay. So if I use this expression, note that is the same hole density everywhere. P0 is the same. NC, uh, there should be an nv here. Uh, nv is not a strong function of temperature. So what happens is you can imagine that this place which is hot here, if I look at in this particular region here, my Fermi energy would be further away from the valence band because temperature is higher. While this place, which is colder, my Fermi energy would be closer to the valence band here. So if I draw the diagram here, at this point, my Fermi energy is closer to the valence band here. If I look at this particular part here, my Fermi energy is further away from the valence band here. Okay, but why? Because simply from coming from this relationship is the same amount of holes everywhere. And if one place is hotter, then hotter means EF is further away. Colder, it means EF is closer to the wellness band here. Okay, there are other things that are happening. You can imagine that the holes are much more energetic here and the holes are uh, have less energy here. More energetic holes will try to flow towards the other side here. Okay, as compared to, so if I look at, you know, 
something hot on one side, something cold, you know, that, that the carriers here will have a more tendency to reach here as compared to carriers from here reaching this particular side here. All right. So all of this, you can see it results in a development of voltage. Let's look at this diagram here. So what I just said, hot EF is further away from EV, cold EF is closer to EV. All right. So I'm drawing the same thing. Hot further away from EV, cold uh, closer to EV. Now you can see here EF at two different positions. This is like a voltage here. This is like a voltage here and 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 the voltage uh, a higher ef manifests itself as a negative voltage here. okay higher ef uh, you know for example if let's say both of them were at the same temperature the ef would have been same ef here and ef here would have been the same now if you apply an external voltage external voltages what do they do they raise the energy diagram okay so they make it so ef would go towards the uh, higher value here so this manifests itself as a negative voltage on the hot side and on the cold side a positive voltage here. so you get one polarity if i do an n-type semiconductor same thing happens in an n-type semiconductor cold ef will be closer to ec hot ef will be further away from ec so if i now look at my fermi energy fermi energy here is lower as compared to this one here so this one becomes this side becomes negative this side is positive so i get two different polarities if i have a p-type uh, then the hot side is negative. If I have an N type, the hot side is, uh, the cold side is negative. And therefore, by simply looking at the polarity, which side is the needle pointing, I can tell whether my semiconductor is P type or N type. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, so if we can tell P type, N type, we can tell how many electrons, how many holes, where the defect levels are, where the, uh, what the mobility is. This experiment, uh, tells you allows you to measure effective mass. We've been talking about effective mass of an electron and, and this experiment allows you to do that. Now note what is happening is the following. I have a sample and we don't apply any electric field or anything. It's just a sample, n-type sample, let's say. And we apply a magnetic field. Now you know that normally the carriers are moving around. Carriers are moving around in, in a semiconductor, right? They move around and they get scattered. But now what we are doing is we are applying a high magnetic field. So if I have a carrier at any point, let's say, which is moving like this here, the magnetic field acts in this direction perpendicular, right? No matter which direction my carrier moves, the, the force that acts upon the, uh, my, uh, would be, Lorentz force would be perpendicular to the direction of the movement here. And what will it try to do? It will try to force the electron to move in a circle, right? That's, you know that a, car a charge moving in a magnetic field executes a circular path here. So that's what is happening. So it would try to force it to move into a circular path. But then what would happen is, as this electron moves here, normally what would happen is it would get scattered. It would get sc scattered here, and then it will not be able to, you know, uh, execute uh, a complete circle here. But if you apply a large enough magnetic field, if you apply a large enough magnetic field, the electron may execute, a, a, you know, a start moving in a circular, uh, in, this, in this circular manner here. Okay, so let's work out the uh, simple maths here. So force acting upon an electron, Q, Vx into Bz, you know, uh, let's say it's in x direction here, and magnetic field is in z, so the force acts in the y direction, we know Q, Vx into Bz here. Force is equal to, we can, uh, we're assuming that the force is making it move in a circular orbit here. So we say M, V square by R, uh, centripetal force here, Q, V, Bz here, and from there one can write, what is the velocity here? Velocity I can write as QR by M's effective mass into Bz. All right. Uh, how much time will it? So this is the velocity and how it is QR and, and all that. So the radii, the radius in which it moves is related to its velocity and mass in this particular manner here. How much time does it uh, take to, you know, move in a uh, circle? That will be equal to 2 pi R divided by the velocity here. So that's, this is the time it takes to move in a circle here. Okay. And that time 2 pi r by v, you can see here 2 pi, uh, r i extract from here. And then v, any, v is anyway there and it cancels out and we get this part here. So the total uh, time it takes to move, you know, the, the, uh, the revolution time, uh, or the time period that you see here is 2 pi qbz me here. 
but then it would be able to move in this kind of a circle only if this time is smaller than this scattering time. Otherwise, you know, it moves and gets scattered uh, and it's not able to move here. So I, if I note that if I apply my magnetic field, which is large, if I apply my magnetic field, which is large, and at the same time, suppose I go to lower temperature. What does lower temperature do? Lower temperature means scattering becomes less, right? All the phonons and all that are less. So lower temperature means this becomes large. So two things I will have to do. I make this term large and I make Bz also large here. I make tau L large by going to lower temperature and I make Bz large here and thereby I ensure that my electron is able to move in these circles like this here. So once an electron is moving in this particular circle now, okay, and uh, now what I do is I bring in a photon. All right, I bring in a photon light and now this light, if its frequency matches with the frequency with which this is rotating, a sort of resonance occurs and my electron starts absorbing energy. Okay, my electron. So if I have, a, a, let's say, and, and we, uh, the frequencies are typically in the microwave region here. So now if this electron is moving and if the frequency of your microwave uh, electromagnetic wave here sort of matches with the frequency of this one here, my electron starts absorbing energy from the field here. Okay, and a, a, a sort of resonance occurs between the uh, electromagnetic wave here and, and, and the electron here and you start absorbing and the uh, absorption in energy can be experimentally measured. So you, you, you're, you have a certain amount of uh, radiation incident and then you can measure how much re radiation is coming out from the other end and therefore you can tell whether absorption is occurring or not occurring. And, and so by this means, what can you measure? See, if I, if let's say this frequency that you, that you see here is let's say uh, 10 gigahertz and the electromagnetic wave that is coming here is 100 gigahertz, what will happen? This is 10 and the uh, electromagnetic wave is 100 gigahertz. Your sample is not going to absorb. It's only when resonance occurs, the frequency of this and this matches, then only you start getting absorption. So what can I measure then? I can measure the resonance frequency F. And if I know F, then you know that I know BZ, whatever I have applied. What do I know then? The effective mass. Okay. I get the effective mass here. So it's a very direct way of measuring what the effective mass is. At. So let me show you an early, you can read more about this uh, ex uh, paper. The details are given here. Uh, uh, and uh, look at that. What they're doing is they're measuring uh, uh, the mass of electrons and holes uh, in silicon and germanium. And this is the fundamental equation that we have. You know, if I take this particular equation here, 2 pi q b z m and, and f here. So that's the equation that I end up getting here. So typically in an experiment, what they would do is they would fix the microwave frequency. Okay, they would fix the frequency. F naught is fixed. And what they would do is they would scan the magnetic field. Right. So note what is happening here. They're looking at the absorption. Absorption here. How much? Is your sample absorbing that microwave frequency here? So F naught is fixed and they're scanning the uh, uh, magnetic field here, starting from low value. So as I increase the magnetic field, at some point, the resonance will occur here. So at some point, you can see here, peak. It, it starts to absorb here and then falls here. And then another absorption occurs here and then falls here. And then another absorption and falls and all of that. Each absorption is, is denoting a particular effective mass here. Okay, so they're pointing out that there is a hole here which has an effective mass like this here, another hole. If you recall, we talked about that valence band has two, a, a, a heavy hole and a light hole. There are different species of holes also present. Okay, so these resonances then allow you to measure at what magnetic field does a resonance occur. And once you know the magnetic field and you know F0, and you, from that you know that there is each resonance corresponds to a effective mass and you can calculate what that effective mass is. OK, so the concepts that we have started then and you can actually go ahead and do these experiments and, 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 and uh, you know, measure what the effective masses are. OK. All right. So that's effective mass now. So we can know effective mass of electrons. We can know effective mass of holes through this kind of an experiment. In the last lecture, we were looking at recombination. OK, now let me tell you how we can. And, and there was a term that was entering which was called recombination lifetime. 
how can we measure recombination lifetime? If you recall, uh, if I take a sample like this, and, and this is the, the problem that we had solved in the last lecture. So we take a sample like this, its resistance will be equal to resistivity times L by A. Resistivity is Q and mu N due to electrons and P mu P due to holes here. Okay. Uh, so that's the resistance. And then we take the sample, we shine light on it, and we get generation. And how much excess holes and electrons we get, we had solved in the last lecture. We said you can do that by looking at uh, continuity equation. We are talking about steady state, so we put del P by del T equals to zero. There's no, uh, I've not applied any, no current is flowing. I'm simply measuring the resistance. Uh, so uh, uh, there's no current which is flowing, so this term is zero. And therefore, we get the number of uh, generation rate equal to recombination rate here. And recombination, we model it by simply delta P by tau P, excess holes divided by a lifetime. And we know what the excess holes are then. Delta P will be equal to G times tau P here. So now these are the excess number of holes and the same number of excess number of electrons will be there. So you can imagine now a new R would be N plus this term here and P, which will be equal to the original P0 plus this term here. So now because of these excess electrons and excess holes, your resistance is going to drop. Okay, the resistance is going to drop and, and therefore you can measure the change in the resistance and you can increase the light intensity and you can measure what the changes in resistances are. So that experiment you can do. Now what you can do is the following. So uh, we know how to calculate. What you can do is once you shine a light, now what you do is suddenly you switch it off. You have a light falling. Resistance has, let's say, uh, dropped from initial initial values of 1 kilo ohm to something like, let's say, uh, 0.98 kilo ohm or whatever, 0.95 kilo ohm, right? Resistance has dropped. Now, suddenly you switch off the light. What will happen now? You have all these excess carriers, right? All these excess carriers were there, delta P. What will happen to them? They will disappear. And they will disappear with what time constant? Well, let's work it out. Let's see how, how they will disappear here. So we have, we are talking about now transient photoconductivity. We have light falling and now we switch off the light. Now, if we switch off the light and we want to know what happens to excess holes here, excess holes and excess electrons, because excess holes and excess electrons is what affect the resistive resistance here. So let's find out. So let's take the continuity equation. What do we do? <laughs> Again, we don't have any current flowing, so we put this equal to zero. I have switched off the light. So what do I put? GP equal to zero. So I get this equation, del P by del T, zero, zero, light has been switched off, minus del P by tau P. Right, so it's a simple equation, uh, uh, which tells us how excess holes will decay, and you know excess holes will decay as delta P equal to delta P zero, exponent minus T by tau P. So if the excess holes are decaying like this, excess electrons are also decaying like this, what will happen to the resistance? You know, if I look at resistance, resistance is nothing but 1 over resistance, if I look at, is nothing but uh, n excess electrons and excess holes. So my resistance is also going to have a, a behavior like this here. So if you measure your resistance as a function of time, then what do you get? You, you will be able to get the recombination lifetime. Right? So that's the method of measuring recombination lifetime. You shine light, you switch it off, and just measure resistance as a function of time. And thereby you get tau P. Okay? All right. One last experiment, which is a very famous experiment by the name of the uh, Shockley, all of you know, and uh, along with his uh, uh, other uh, colleague, uh, Haynes Shockley experiment, which allows you to also measure uh, mobility in a semiconductor here. So the idea in this case is as follows. These are all very, very famous experiments in, uh, you know, semiconductor field. So Haynes Shockley experiment, what is done is the following. You shine light, let's say, on a very uh, small part of the sample. Okay. This is light coming in in a small part of the sample here. So uh, before I describe the whole experiment, if you shine light in a small part of the experiment, uh, this one here, now, remember earlier what were we doing? We were shining all over, uniformly all over, right? That's what we had assumed. But now you're shining only here. So what will happen is you'll create excess holes and excess electrons. But then are they going to stay here? 
you're not shining light here and you're not shining light here so what will happen then hmm? how, how do we figure this out what will be my excess hole density where do we go see we, we have what we have only four or five equations right Poisson equation the two continuity equations right and the equation for current and equation for electron current and a whole current everything is is solved using these equations right so where do you go which equation will tell you where the hole density is you know here here everywhere else in which equation do you have generation term and time term and where do you have continuity equation right so you go to continuity equation but you can imagine that what i'm doing is the following i'm creating suppose a a, a, a sheet of charge here a very narrow right and then after creating it for a very short period, I switch it off. Uh, you know, it's like a laser pulse which goes in and creates a very narrow, very narrow laser pulse goes in and creates almost like a delta function charge. here. And then you switch it off. And then what will happen? What you're doing is you're creating a packet of charge here. Holes, let's talk about holes, excess holes here. Okay. So you're creating a packet of holes here. And then you've switched off. So what will happen to this packet of holes? Two things will happen. Note that if I have excess holes here and I don't have holes here, excess holes here, what will it do? If you have high hole density at one place and low hole density, a diffusion occurs, right? So it will start diffusing. These holes will start diffusing here and these holes will start diffusing here. Not only that, as diffusion occurs, what will happen to these excess holes? They recombine with electrons, and they will die out also. So you can imagine now, this is, let's say, the red one that you see here is at time t equal to zero. As time proceeds, the holes have spread out to, you know, the holes have diffused here and diffused here, but some of them have recombined also. So if I integrate the hole density, the blue line that you see here, if I integrate, the integrated hole density will not be the same as the original one because some have recombined. If I wait for even longer time, it diffuses even more and it diffuses even more and it recombines. So eventually what will happen is the, all the excess holes that you see here, they will all spread out and they will all sort of die out, right? So this is what is happening. If you just have a very narrow pulse of light, which is incident for a very short duration, okay? This is what will happen to the holes here. But now let's do something interesting here. All right, and, and we can find out how this hole density is going here how this is, you know, spreading out and decaying. And as I said, the method to do that is the uh, continuity equation. So in the continuity equation, we have del P by del T, del JP by del X, GP minus RP. G is what? Zero now, because I shine, uh, you know, the light was on for a very short period of time. And I'm looking at what happens after you remove the light. So there's no generation. Is there a current? Is there a current? Why? Because the electrons, uh, the holes are diffusing here and diffusing here. I've not applied any voltage. What kind of current? Diffusion current. And recall, diffusion current is minus Q dP del P by del X. So I should take this equation, plug it here. I should put G equal to zero. And R, what should I put? What is the model for R? Delta P by tau P. Okay. So RP, RP recombination is delta P by tau P. So take these and put it here and you end up with this equation. What is this equation then? It is a little bit of trouble for us. It's a partial differential equation. We have to solve it in time as well as in X. And so since it's trouble, I will not solve it. I'll give you the result only, okay? And I'm sure uh, all of you have done a course in partial, right? Uh, so this is not a difficult equation, right? <laughs> or is it difficult? Is it difficult or easy? You've solved equations like this? No or yes? Uh, so, okay, so yes, I, I heard yes, so I'll give you the solution. So, solution is yeah. All right, solution is yeah. Okay, two things you note. Uh, N0 is what? N0 is the total charge that you had initially created at time t equal to zero, a total number of excess holes that you had created here. So, you can see here, x squared by 4 dpt is what? It's spreading out. That's what it shows, right? It, 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 you know, the it's like a Gaussian, uh, you know, the, the packet is spreading out. And what does this denote? It decay. That is also recombining. If you had no recombination, if you had no recombination, then it would have simply spread out. 
right? But you have recombination also, so it shows this kind of a behavior. Okay. As I said, the maths may be a little bit involved, uh, but we can understand qualitatively also why this is happening. But his Shockley experiment goes a little beyond this. What it does is the following now. Okay, so this is the summary of what we said. That if you create a narrow pulse of light and you switch it off very quickly, then you have a packet of holes and the holes start diffusing and recombining and the packet of holes, it spreads out and eventually, of course, everything dies out. And this is the behavior here. Now, Haynes Shockley experiment says, do the following. Apply a voltage across the n-type semiconductor. <laughs> so you create a field. You create a field here. And at, at some point before the contact here, you put a probe connected to the oscilloscope. What are we going to see? Can we guess what will happen? Again, you shine a pulse of light, right? Pulse of light. So you create a packet of holes here. Earlier, the holes were simply spreading out. What else will happen to this packet of holes now? Note what is there? A field is there. And what will this field do? It will push that packet towards the right here. And eventually, as this packet of holes that you see here, what is happening to it? It's spreading out, but it's also moving towards the right. Eventually, this packet of holes, what will happen? It will come to this particular electrode here. And as it comes here, what will you see on the oscilloscope? You'll see changes. If you know, if, if I, if I, for example, if I take here and put a resistor or something, a, 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 these packet of holes, once they reach here, they'll flow out through this and they'll develop a current and a voltage. So I can detect what will happen on the oscilloscope after how much time does this packet start and, and is, you know, reaches this particular end here. And therefore, I've created a packet of charge and this packet of charge moves and arrives at this particular point here. And I can find out after how much time it arrives. And therefore, I can measure, you know, I know the, uh, so I know the length here between here and here. And I can measure after how much time the packet of charge arrives. So what can I measure? L divided by time. It gives me the drift velocity. And I know the field in my sample here. So drift velocity divided by electric field will give you the, the mobility. Okay. So you can see this is what will happen to your packet of charge here. It starts here, then Earlier, it was spreading out from here only, but now it moves also. Its center moves and the center moves here. And eventually, you can find out where uh, it reaches you. Of course, you don't want your packet to spread out too much, right? You don't want it to spread out too much to, to get a, 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 a precise measure of uh, uh, the time here, okay? Now, uh, the same equation holds, except that now uh, the whole packet, you know, moves right with a certain velocity. So what you do is the mu p times field gives you the velocity. So uh, velocity times time here. So all that happens is that the center here keeps on shifting according to mu p times f times t. Okay. So the oscilloscope here also as the packet reaches here, remember after it reaches here, you will begin to see some current here. As, as this part reaches, the current will build up. And then eventually, again, you will see current going down here. So the, the oscilloscope will also manifest some kind of a, uh, you know, uh, related to this kind of a behavior here. And once you get that, then you know your equations, you can figure out uh, 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 how much, uh, uh, you know, after how much time does the peak arrive here. Okay. And the peak is, you know, the peak is moving with this velocity here, mu p times f times t here. Okay. So you can figure out what is the drift velocity here. All right. Okay, so as, as usual, let's do one. Uh, let's see if you guys are good at uh, continuity equation now. If you can handle continuity equation. <laughs> so from next lecture, we'll do lots of Poisson equation. So today, let's do some continuity equation. All right, so, so the idea is as follows in this problem. Please understand. I have a piece of n-type silicon and I have a light. I have light incident here from the left and the light is of very short wavelength. Very short wavelength. Do you recall what happens to absorption coefficient? Very short wavelength. Does anybody recall absorption coefficient versus wavelength? If you go to wavelength, which is very short, your absorption coefficient becomes very high. So if I have a, 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 this thing here, light of very short wavelength, all the light will get absorbed at the surface only. Okay? 
And so what I'm doing is through this laser, I'm creating an excess holes here. And let's suppose the excess hole at x equal to zero is delta p zero. Okay. So, but all along in my sample, there's no generation because generation is only occurring in a very narrow place here. Okay. So I have some excess holes delta p zero. What I want to know is what about the hole profile in the rest of my sample? How will delta p x change in the rest of the sample? Mm -hmm. Given the boundary condition that the hole density here at x equal to zero is fixed delta p zero. So what is delta p x then? Note in all this sample here, there's no generation, but there would be recombination. And I'm talking about steady state. So use continuity equation and write down what the continuity equation then becomes in steady state with no generation, only recombination. Okay. And recombination, remember, recombination R is delta P by tau P. Right? That's recombination. So continuity equation, people remember. If, they, if you don't remember, this is what it is. Okay. Del P by del T, steady state means zero. Generation means zero. Delta RP, delta P by tau P. JP will be what? Minus Q DP, DP by DX. Diffusion will be there. Okay. So J is minus Q DP, DP by DX. So now plug it here. You know the boundary condition. At X equal to zero, you have delta P zero. Find out what happens to delta P X. All right, so simple uh, uh, second order differential equation. Everybody got this equation, I'm sure. Okay, so simple equation here. The solution is delta P X is delta P zero exponent minus X by LP. Okay, what does it denote? It denotes that you created excess holes here and the excess holes spread out, but then they also die out because of recombination. And how do they spread out? They spread out exponentially. They decay exponentially. And therefore, what would you like to call this length? Decay length, yes. But what else? What is it? Why, why is it spreading out? Diffusion. So what do we call this? Diffusion length. So if you create excess holes in one place, it's going to spread out from there. And over what distance will it spread out? It spreads out over a diffusion length, two, three diffusion lengths. It spreads out and then after that it will die out. Okay. So the concept of diffusion length is very important. And, uh, and, and, and so this particular example shows you what happens uh, when you create excess holes and how they spread out and, and over what distance do they spread out. And, and uh, we'll see uh, this is very important for PN junction. PN junctions, uh, this particular phenomena is very important.